Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In view of current events, I am convinced that people who continue to insist upon the language of postmodernism are guilty of murder. A bullet is not a narrative. A cylindrical projectile launched from a chamber through the rapid expansion of gas induced by combustion is a fact. Just ask a nursing mother. She will tell you. A bullet is not a narrative. It is a sin. Het, tet, aleph. It can be tallied unless you work for the Washington Post. In that case, it can be explained. Ad excusandas, excusationes, in peccatis. To make excuses for excuses in sins. Your brother is not a competing narrative. He is a man, an earth mammal, standing next to you in the land. He is your neighbor, Syntax. If you are a man of scripture, there is no such thing as a competing narrative, let alone silly descriptors like deeply tragic. The Occidental expression competing narratives reigns supreme among all lies ever sown by the makers of bullets because it allows them to masquerade as arbiters of righteousness. But I say to you, put not your trust in the makers of bullets, in princes and sons of men, in whom there is no salvation. Such men are evil through and through, ravenous wolves, Jesus warns, who come to you in sheep's clothing. There are no narratives, stories, contexts, or meanings just animals, vegetation, fish in the sea, and birds in the air, and his righteousness endures forever. There is also the ground, the Adama, facts upon it and consonants over it, the rule of Elohim and his righteousness endures forever. Those who submit to his righteousness are his to deem righteous, and those who do not are also his, and his righteousness endures forever. Those wicked who talk about narratives, stories, meanings, and competing narratives are the makers and sellers of snake oil. Pundits, journalists, artisans, and apologists Uncle Thomas Friedman's, who fashion idols in their own image to set themselves above God and his, quote, animal kingdom. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a human, like the beauty of the human form, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast 
and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. But the rest of it, he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships it. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. But I say to you, there is no god but Elohim, and we are all animals in his kingdom, and his righteousness endures forever. This week's episode covers Luke chapter 5, verse 32. After 10 years of programming, the Bible as Literature podcast will take a sabbatical starting mid-February and extending until after Pascha in May following the Eastern calendar. This sabbatical will provide an opportunity for me to concentrate on Father Paul's work and some exciting developments planned for his weekly podcast. Rest assured, while the Bible as Literature is on temporary hiatus, I will continue to produce Father Paul's program, Tarazi Tuesdays, on a weekly basis. I still have one more episode of this program recorded and ready for release next week, so stay tuned. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to episode 519 of the Bible as Literature podcast. It's tempting when you come across a verse in the New Testament, like the one that I'm about to read for you. It's all too easy, and this is what preachers do, to begin talking about righteousness as a concept or a theme in the Bible or forgiveness of sins and how Jesus came to minister to sinners to help sinners get back on the path to repentance. These are three terms that appear right away in verse 32 of chapter 5 in Luke. Or to try to figure out who the real sinners are in the passage. Are the sinners the tax collectors, the guests that were invited? Are they the Pharisees and the grammatis who are grumbling at the disciples? Are the disciples sinners? I mean, the disciples throughout the New Testament and certainly in the Gospel of Luke often act like clowns. Who are the people that are in need of repentance? Who are the sinners? And what is happening in verse 32? You could talk about that. You could try to figure out what the quote narrative is about. But when you do that, you're creating your own God and you will eventually end up with a theology. These texts were not presented to be interpreted. These texts were written to be heard. Those to whom they were addressed, and they were not addressed to any of us. They were written for a specific audience. I will keep saying it. Forget reception history. Forget making the text relevant today. Once you take that step, it ceases to function as the biblical text. It becomes your theology, your nonsense. These texts, for the audience to whom they were addressed, did not require any intervention by an institutional teacher. They could be heard. That doesn't mean that the brains of the addressee did not muck it up. It meant that the addressee was responsible to unmuck it and submit to what is written. It also means that we, when we are hearing these texts and studying them, have no right 
to systematically impose the muck, which we call with our sophistry, story and narrative and meaning, etc., etc. So how do we get around this? Lexicography. Instead of waxing philosophical about what it means to call sinners to repentance, which is how everyone preaches on the verse that I'm about to read to you, we would do better to take these terms, the terminology, understand how these terms connect to the original consonantal text in the Hebrew, how they're used in the Hebrew text, where they appear, so that we have some sense of what Luke is doing when Jesus uses these terms. That's it. This is not a bedtime story. If you want to hear the text of Luke, do it on your own dime. If you want to learn terminology and study terminology and learn about the biblical languages, if you want to learn about the Semitic roots, and if you want to understand how to hear Greek in the way that the biblical text makes the Greek submit to the Hebrew so that you can hear Greek Semitically, then stick with it. Because this is about terminology, it's not about meaning. When someone tells you it's about meaning, it's a fancy way of saying what lazy people said to you in college. Just give me the gist. I don't need to go through all the detail. Just give me a basic idea of what it's saying. It's how marketing people talk. Let me give you the spin. That's how politicians talk. They want to give you a narrative. They want to tell you what it means because once you're talking about meaning, then someone is in control. But you cannot take control away from God, the scriptural God. When you start dealing with lexicography, when you start dealing with roots, when you start forcing people to disavow themselves of the gist, of the meaning, of the storyline, of the narrative, and you start equipping them with roots, with terminology, with function, when their eyes start to glaze over, then we're dealing with the Debarim of Elohim. And once they're so bored that all they have are consonants jumbled up in their head, just keep pushing, keep pushing, not for years, for decades, until when they hear the biblical text in English, they get frustrated because they know the people reading it and the people hearing it are not hearing scripture. Once they get to that point, then there's hope against hope that they won't be fooled. They won't be fooled by wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. And that's a technical statement in Matthew. And it pertains to the terminology that's used here in Luke. Because in the Psalter, there are terms that are used to defend the throne of God against the wicked. What does that have to do with the Gospel of Luke? Well, you wouldn't know if you weren't doing lexicography. Because you imagine that the text of Luke is about you. You imagine, like everybody who picks up this text, that Jesus loves you and he's here because you're a sinner and he wants to help you. No. Jesus is not from Minnesota. He's from the Middle East. He's from Thomas Friedman's Animal Kingdom, which means he's the ox that you want to muzzle, but instead he muzzles you in the Gospel of Luke, as I explained a couple episodes back. You can't muzzle Jesus. Why? Because he's not interested in you. He is interested in his father's throne and protecting his father's honor, which means he's going to do what it takes to protect his father's throne 
from the wolf in sheep's clothing, from the wicked. That's how it functions in the Psalter. God, Elohim, is here to establish his justice. He is the judge who sits on the throne of victory to establish his righteousness. Just listen to verse 32 of chapter 5. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This word, thikeos, anybody who has studied the letters of Paul knows, anybody who's heard us talk about the letters of Paul on this podcast, it's been said a zillion times. Just go back and read Father Paul's masterpiece on the book of Galatians. Thikeos, righteousness, has nothing to do with your actions. It is the judgment of the judge. It is a declaration. You've heard me say it a zillion times. Now this word, which is a technical term in the New Testament, doesn't appear out of thin air. Paul didn't say it because he was studying Greek rhetoric or Greek philosophy. He didn't say it because he was a master of Roman law. It may be that it was functional for a Greek-speaking Roman or a Latin-speaking Roman because it was a functional notion in Roman law, but it comes from the Old Testament. It comes from biblical Hebrew. It's functional in the Psalter. This word, thikeos, corresponds to the Hebrew sodik, which means, depending on how it's used, remember, it's a root, not a word. I'm already vocalizing it when I say sadiq, but it can mean, depending on its function, just or innocent or in the right. Someone who is deemed in the Old Testament by the one who sits on the throne as righteous. It's a judgment. Of course, in Arabic, you have the corresponding triliteral, Sod, dal, qaf. The triliteral in Arabic pertains to truth, honesty, and righteousness, and their formal attestation or confirmation legally. For example, in Arabic, the musadiq is the one who believes or confirms the truth of the matter. It's something that is attested to, confirmed, or made legal. That's why in the Muslim tradition, and I've written about this, I've preached about it, you have this powerful invocation, Sadaq Allah Al-Azim, God the Almighty, which means his might is above all might, the most magnificent, the greatest of all, above all, as the Musadiq, Sad Dal Qaf, the one who confirms by his judgment that his speech is righteous and true. In other words, he speaks the truth. Sadaq Allah al-Azim, God Almighty speaks the truth. Under God's ruling, when you proclaim the sacred text, it is already confirmed as true by God, it is proclaimed in its proclamation as true, and everyone must bow to the ground and keep their mouth shut. Just listen to how it functions in Deuteronomy. Or what great gadol nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous, sadiqim, as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? So in the Old Testament... In the Quran, this root functions as righteousness, which pertains to judgment from the one who confirms what is just and what is righteous and what is true. He is the one who holds righteousness in his hand in order to defend his throne against those who would threaten it. Who are the ones in the Psalter who would threaten? Well, Father Paul talks about this in his commentary 
on the book of Psalms, his introduction to the Old Testament, volume three, he explains that it relates to the kingly court. That's the backdrop for this metaphor that the wicked, the rasha, are those who are close to the one who sits on the throne. Those are the wolves in sheep's clothing. They appear as an ally, but in fact, they work against the throne. That's technically the definition of the wicked. Now, why do I mention the wicked? Because, again, I want to read verse 32. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amartolus in verse 32. Now, what does this word correspond to? There are different possibilities in the Hebrew, but the most obvious is rasha, which means wicked. In a few cases, amartolos aligns to the function het, tet, aleph, but its placement and usage here in Luke, alongside other terminology from the Psalter, and its frequent use in the Septuagint to render rasha, favor the function, resh, sheen, ein. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked, rasha'im. Jesus is defending his dad's throne. In fact, he himself is at risk. He is calling upon his father to save him because the throne is under siege, which means he is in danger. So Jesus is not coming to call sinners to repentance because he's concerned about sinners. It is the honor of the throne that he's concerned about. That's how you have to un pack what's happening by looking at terminology. The last term is this word repentance. Metanian is derived from the same root as metania, which means change of mind. It's a combination of noeo, which means to think or to understand, indicating thought or perception combined with meta, which means a change or after. Both mean repentance or change of mind, so they're functionally the same. The word metanoeo in the consonantal text corresponds to the Hebrew term naham, which means to regret or to be sorry. It can sometimes function as self-consolation, but very often a change of mind. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind Yinnahem, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Yinnahem, that's 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. I have listened and heard. They have spoken what is not right. No man repented. Niham, of his wickedness. Ra'at, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned Shav to his course like a horse charging into battle. That's Jeremiah 8, 6. One thing that's worth mentioning is that it's the same root from which the title of the book of Nahum is derived, Nun Het Mem, which gives it the value to comfort or to console. That's how we hear the title of the book of Nahum. So it depends on how it's used, in what setting. That's how we render its function. So this is what's happening in verse 32. The lesson is that everyone has to be belittled. Remember previously, when we were talking about this term kakos, which means bad or badly, loosely speaking, it corresponds to the Hebrew Kalel, which means cursed or belittled. In Arabic, the same function means reduced or minimized to make something trivial. 
something is belittled, that's what scripture does to you. It belittles you. So the implication, if you're hearing the Semitic functionality, is that in order to preserve the honor of the throne of God's justice and righteousness, those who imagine that they are well must be belittled so that the wicked are brought to a change of mind, so that the wicked are brought to repentance. And of course, how are they brought to repentance? When do we hear this most important expression, Sadaq Allah al Azim, after someone calls, shouts out, recites the sacred text? Now in English it says call to repentance, and the word in Greek is kalese. But what is the word in Hebrew to which it corresponds via the Septuagint? Qara. It's the same in Arabic. Qara'a, to recite. That's how you say read in Arabic. Qara, to call, to shout, to appoint, to summon. This is how Jesus defends the throne of God. Sadaq Allah al Azim. Until next time. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.